hopefully that's good. You get something fun before your, your day starts. Um, so yeah, so I'm Kelly Callahan. I'm out here in Maine and I have a practice here and I do some teaching in um, Portland, Maine. We have a small school I'm involved with there. Um, and I also just started doing some teaching with the Academy for Homeopathy Education with um, Denise Strages and Alastair Gray. So it's been going really well. Um, so yeah, as Karen mentioned, I, I was really excited to do this and I was excited to think about doing a session on provings. And um, I thought about it for a couple different reasons. One is I've, I've, I've been involved in several provings and I, I really love them. I love the whole experience of being in a proving. And when I was doing the Dynamis program with Jeremy Scher, we had to do a student project and um, you could do any project you wanted as long as it had something to do with homeopathy or you could help him on something that he does. And I thought, well, I have my whole life to do projects that I want to do. I've got three years here studying with Jeremy, so I'm going to help him on something he's doing because that will give me an opportunity to learn something new. And so one of the things that he does is he has a, a repertory called the Repertory of Mental Qualities, uh, the QREP. Are either anybody familiar with that who's on? No. Okay, I'll explain a little bit about that. Yes, great. Andrea, do you use it? Okay, so you're just familiar with it, but you don't use it. Great. So basically, um, what Jeremy found was that he was often, often having to combine rubrics within the mind chapters to get at big concepts like control or a victim or money. There wasn't any one rubric that he felt he could rely on. He had to com combine lots of small rubrics. He didn't want to assume what his patient meant. And sometimes people can't be specific with us, but we know that issue is there. So he would combine all these rubrics and he got tired of doing that. So he decided he would make kind of a la Burninghausen, these big general mind rubrics. And the cool thing about it is that what it enabled him to do was um, to not only go into the remedies that we have, but to look at new provings because he only looked at, looks at the mind and the dreams symptoms. Um, and so, you know, because we're not having to get all of the symptoms from a new proving, we can, what we do is we read new provings, any new provings, any kind of new proving. And if there's any indication of that certain theme within that remedy, then it gets into the rubric. So this is what I did when I did my project was I volunteered to read provings and to look for the themes from the QREP in the proving. And it was the first time I'd really sat down and actually read provings before, which I, you know, I had tried to read provings before, but I got very fed up very quickly <laughs> because I didn't know what to do with them. They're often, they can be very unorganized. There's not a lot of um, standardization between how people present the information from their provings. Some have tons of symptoms, some have not a lot of symptoms. Um, but this enabled me to have a structure and think, okay, okay, I'm reading for these ideas. And so it became easier for me to read them. And through that, I really started to enjoy reading them and realize that there's, there's a way that we can use these provings in a, that's more helpful for us as opposed to, um, you know, picking them up and thinking, ah, I don't know what to do with this. Give me back to my vermulin or get me back to my talk or whatever Materia Medica we use. So I've continued to work on the QREP um, in various capacities and um, it's just really held my interest in provings. And so my hope for these sessions is one to share a little bit of what I've learned over the years of working with the provings, but really also for us to learn from each other and explore together. I, I have experience with provings, but I by no means am an expert and I'm trying to get better at it too. So my approach is also like, let's learn together. That's why it's called fun with provings. Like let's have fun with them and figure out like how can we use these in a way that's really helpful 
and learn from each other. So that's, that's my hope with these sessions. Um, I'd love to hear from you guys if either of you has done improving before or a little bit about maybe what your experience is. You participated in one. Great. Never done one. I'm from Andrea. So I can't see, who said I have participated in one? I can't see your full name. I can see M-A-R. Oh, Marjorie, hi. Enjoy, you've not done one. Marjorie, what proving did you participate in? Hesitant to do one from Andrea. Yeah, we will definitely talk about that. Mini proving of Alim Sipa and Sativa and tobacco. Great. Okay. Marjorie, did you do it with an organized collective or like through a school or who was? Through a homeopath. And Karen, is that you saying you did cordyceps? Yes. Yes. Cool. And I actually just found um, your article in the American Homeopath from several years ago about uh, the pig provings. Yes, I was just about to put that in here too. That was an amazing experience as well. Well, I was so happy to find that article because it brought up several things that are such interesting points of discussion. So I don't know if we'll get to it today, but we definitely will at some point. Oh, good. Yeah. Cool. So you guys have already brought up several things um, that we will get to at some point, like you know, mini provings, like the different types of provings there are, because there are lots of different types of provings. They're definitely not all the same. Um, being a little hesitant to do them is definitely a very real and totally normal way to, um, to approach the idea of doing a proving. Um, and even after you've done one, you can be hesitant to do one, <laughs> even if you've had a good experience with it. So I'm going to share my screen and um, all right. I want to make sure I can see the chat still when I do this. You can, instead of sharing your screen, you can just share the PDF document, which means that you still have control of the rest of your screen. I thought I did that. Otherwise, there's not an easy way to float the chat. I can let you know anything that comes up in chat. Okay. I can, I can be your chat buddy. Okay. Great. Okay. So, um, so provings are really, I mean, they're, they're the pillar upon which our whole practice stands, actually. Um, and this, this comes from Jeremy Sher's book. Um, which is, I really highly recommend everybody get it, even if you aren't going to do provings or, um, you know, you just, it's just pure interest. I mean, this is kind of like the manual that came out when Jeremy started after he had done about a half a dozen provings. Um, and, but it's also, you learn a lot about just how we handle substances and how our materia medica gets built because it gets built on provings. So understanding this process is really the going to the primary place of how we learn about our medicines. So this is the dynamics and methodology of homeopathic provings. It's a skinny little book. Um, and it's very, you know, it's very succinct, but very thorough. Um, and Jeremy says that, you know, without accurate provings, everything we prescribe on would be a vague guess or at the worst, pure fiction. Um, and that includes things like toxicology, um, using signatures, and he says fancy ideas. Um, and I know to some extent Jeremy is talking about things like some of the more modern tables and systems that we have now 
which have a lot of value in a lot of ways, but, um, but at the same time, there's a lot of prediction that happens within those systems. And I think that's something important to know because if we are gonna be using remedies, using different methodologies, we wanna know what are we basing our methodology on, right? Um, and so like, for example, the periodic table, a lot of it's been proven, but it hasn't all been proven. And a lot of the um, systems that are laid out are kind of a, not really like a projection, but a, um, an anticipation of what this potential column or this row could be if we don't have approving for a certain um, element. And lots of people are using that very successfully. So definitely not speaking anything against it, but it is important to know those ones that do have provings and those ones that don't. And when you do have approving for a substance, you're gonna get a much deeper, much richer, much more full understanding of that substance and its capability than if we just use our own imagination and our own projection or thoughts about what that substance could possibly, um, could possibly affect in a person. Kelly, can I add something in here? Mm -hmm. This topic that you're talking about, do we work just from the factual data of the provings or do we take our ideation about things and also add that to the Materia Medica? This has been actually a bitter point of debate through all of homeopathy. Yeah. And one of the things that Benninghausen did was look at the data for Bryonia saying, Bryonia headaches are worse from motion. Bryonia vomiting is worse from motion. Bryonia back pain is worse from motion. And so he started putting the modality of worse from motion in other Bryonia symptoms that had not come out of the provings if he had seen them clinically or if he conjectured that they were likely. And this started a huge, huge debate. And one of the things that we can do now is say, there's provings, which is data that we know. And then there's ideation, which is data that we suspect, which doesn't make it wrong. It just makes it unproven, if I can pun on that word. And so when we use some of that information, we need to go back and check with ourselves later. Did that work out? Was that true so that we can build the Materia Medica forward? Maybe there will be things like Bryonia being worse from motion in so many ways that we will be discovering like Benninghausen, but maybe it'll be like a lot of other ideas that have come and gone under the bridge. And so we have to go back and carefully reflect on how did we figure out to use this remedy? Were we using approving? Were we using ideation? And did it, how did it turn out? Yeah, yeah, I'll add to that a little bit because my understanding about, about what Berninghausen did is a little bit different, um, which is its own kind of philosophical thing, but, and it actually gets into the history of the repertories because when Hahnemann realized, okay, so he had his whole proving guild and they were doing, you know, provings upon provings and, and having now thousands of symptoms, of course, nobody could keep track of this. And so Hahnemann said, okay, we need a way to start to systematize this. Um, and, and Berninghausen came up with the first repertory and he, there was, there was a split camp where they were kind of the purists, the idealists. What they wanted in the repertory was literally the symptoms as they came out in the proving. They wanted it to be exact. They didn't want to break up the symptoms. So like, for example, if it was knee pain worse at night with motion, that is exactly how they wanted it in. So you would look up that full symptom. And what my understanding of what Berninghausen did was he said, well, wait a second. Each person who is in the proving has a, a slice of it. And the only way we can ever know the full capability of how this would reveal itself is if every person took the remedy, which of course we don't have, right? We only have 20 people or 30 people. And so he, he did this concept of analogy and generalization. So yes, he did generalize the thing like, whoa, yes, we have worse from motion, worse from motion, worse from motion. And so he did kind of 
project the, the general idea that if these people had these four symptoms that are worse for motion, if another 20 people took bryonia and proved it, then it's very likely that we will see this idea of worse for motion come out in these other symptoms. Yes, he was Which, moving from what he knew into something stronger. And, mm -hmm. and data has borne that out and Hahnemann actually supported that, but it caused he a did. rift. The first repertory was actually built by Ernst Ruckert. It's, it's in Hale's Museum in Stuttgart. But yeah. then Benninghausen took it over like a decade later. And this was, uh, there was a huge fight about how provings came into the repertory and whether to include clinical data in the repertory, exactly the way that you're right. describing. There was Yar and Hempel and Hart and Gentry and people who, I mean, it caused some very bitter divides. And even today, there is no group or organization that basically owns or administers on a global scale the data in the repertory, which is yeah. why we see uneven adding of that data from various provings. Yeah. If, if people are interested in kind of the, the burning house and approach and that, I mean, George Dimitriotis has dedicated, you know, his professional life to researching and footnoting and and rewriting Berninghausen's pocketbook. So, and, and that's incredible because it is all, and that's all coming from um, Hahnemann's Materia Medica Pura and his provings. So that's an incredible, um, well-researched resource if people are interested in uh, the Berninghausen approach. Um, so anyway, yeah, I, I mean, I can geek out on the history and all these little things for a really long time because I think it's so fascinating. Um, but yeah, but, but for me, I see a huge a, a, a difference between um, the analogy and the generalization that Berninghausen did versus some of the systems that we have in place now, which I think take bigger leaps in a lot of ways. But that's a yes, personal opinion. They're not propagating existing data in the same way. They're creating a theoretical ideation and saying, Let's see. Let's experiment with this and see. Yeah. And to their, and to their credit, I mean, I know Jan Schulten has said this, is, you know, he, he has identified it as theories and he, he does want to see people's results and whatnot. So it's, it's um, so I just want to make sure I get that in there. Okay. So um, the, the Hahnemann talked about provings in aphorisms 105 to 145. And so definitely, um, they're great. It's a great segment to read. It's probably one of the easier, actually, sections of the organon to read because um, they're, it, they're pretty clear, um, whereas in other sections, you know, the paragraphs are a lot more involved. But those aphorisms are, are, are fairly short and straightforward. Um, although, actually, before I jump ahead, are, were there any questions or comments about that segment of the discussion that we just had from anyone? Oh, there it is. Great. Okay. Now I have the chat now. Yay. Um, okay. So in aphorism 120, um, I pulled out a couple of just sections that I really love because I think it really speaks to the spirit that Hahnemann was coming from. And just also it helps for me to kind of understand that this isn't just an exercise in doing these provings, that it really embodies so much of the spirit of homeopathy. Um, and he says that, you know, only an apt selection of the medicine can quickly and permanently restore the greatest of earthly blessings, the well being of body and soul. And so that aphorism nine that we all love so much that's about, you know, living your life's purpose with unbounded sway, it's like this is how we get there right? We only get to, to provide that experience for somebody, to give them a remedy that will do that when we can choose the medicine that will enable them to do that. And that that is the best thing for people, right? That's the best earthly blessing is to have that well-being of body and soul. And so when we know the medicines well, 
And when we do that through provings, that's what enables us to be able to do that. And really, I mean, you know, we all know the, the legend of Hahnemann proving China as the birth of homeopathy, essentially. I mean, it is our, it is our heritage, it's, it's a legend. And I think in some ways doing a proving is a little bit like a rite of passage, right? To kind of follow in Hahnemann's footsteps in that way. And there's lots of different ways to do it and, and doing a full Hahnemannian proving isn't for everyone. But, um, but, if you, but I think there are ways that we can embody that um, energy and that approach. And it kind of, it, it brings us into the halls with all of those um, who have come before us, especially Hahnemann. <coughs> Excuse me. So one of the, the resources that we often have for um, understanding a medicine is toxicology and poisonings. And he addresses this in aphorism 112. Um, and, and he's also um, it, tr trying to, to say that it's different. You know, doing our provings are not the same as getting poisoning and toxicology results. Um, so when you have a medicine that's ingested in an excessive dose, um, the states, what you're going to see is these kind of violent, very, um, very extreme responses. And you don't see them at the beginning, but you see them at the end. And they're actually opposite to what happens in the beginning. And the symptoms that oppose that action are the counteraction. They're the after action. But in provings, you don't often see that. Because when we're giving small doses, you don't, you see very, very gentle, mild things, most part. Um, and when you're doing, when you're giving a remedy to heal someone, um, you only see enough to, for the, for the vital force to respond to the disease, right? To re, to rouse the healthy state. So in this aphorism, he's, he's, you know, he's really saying like the whole, the whole material aspect of that poisoning and that toxicology creates this very intense, you know, after response on the part of the vital force that is not what you see when you do the proving with a homeopathic remedy or when you give it as a, you give the homeopathic remedy medicinally. And so therefore we can't really depend on just toxicology and poisonings as being our, um, our information because we want to be seeing those more gentle, subtle reactions. And this, okay, Ruja says, wonder about symptoms like convulsions or hemorrhage from the eyes. Someone went to the edge of dying to prove those. So one of the things that we'll be doing as in further sessions when we actually look at provings is, is looking at who did the proving and what did they take and how much and how often. In some proving reports, they do mix the toxicology reports with the homeopathic proving reports. So that's one thing you can get really clear because you're right, those are some really extreme symptoms. And oftentimes when you do actually go into the proving and look at what people took and how much, you'll see that those more extreme symptoms are the toxicology reports, but they were mixed in. Um, which is not to say that people don't have some intense responses to having a remedy, um, but it's also not going to cause the kind of tissue change and like pathology that we see at the end states of actual disease. So one of the ways you can check that, as I say, is by looking at who took the substance and how they took it and whether it was homeopathic or whether it was the toxicology report mixed in. So in aphorism 127, I wanted to bring this out because it just is another, uh, it's another indication to me of how ahead of the time homeopathy is. Um, that Hahnemann wrote in the Organon under, you know, in his whole section about provings that testing on males and females is necessary in order to bring to light gender related conditions and alterations. And for contrast, Congress did not mandate the adequate inclusion of women 
and the um, National Institute of Health sponsored clinical trials until 1993. And if you do any kind of Googling or looking in at, you know, women in clinical trials and things like that, it's a real problem. Um, white men were considered the norm and their response was the only reliable, true response. It wasn't thought that women would respond any differently. But Hahnemann, you know, here we are way back 200 years ago, understood this. And I just think that's really amazing and awesome. And it makes me so happy to be a homeopath. <laughs> And aphorism 137 is just a little bit more about this idea of giving really large doses. Um, and this aphorism for me really speaks to, again, kind of the spirit and the place where Hahnemann's coming from with what this medicine is about and how he wants it to affect humanity. Um, he's saying when you give these large doses and you give these, there are all these after actions, you get things cropping up in a confused haste and violence that nothing can be exactly observed, right? It's too intense, there's too much happening. And it's dangerous for the prover to take excessively large doses. And he says, this cannot be a matter of indifference to anyone who has regard for humankind and who prizes the least of the people as his brother. I just think that's such a beautiful sentiment. I mean, he, he his whole approach was to do the least amount of harm, right? To heal people quickly, um, gently, and the same goes for finding out what these medicines can do. There's no place for suffering in finding out what can be healing. I mean, people are gonna suffer a little bit, but not the way that you would with these poisonings and toxicology um, or toxic approaches or from experimenting on the sick. And, you know, kind of like I was saying with the, the idea that, you know, only since 1993 has our Institutes of Health recognized the difference in women, um, our medical history is full of just absolutely tragic experiments in ways that, you know, minorities and um, people have been taken advantage of. And I, I, really, I really appreciate that right from the beginning, Hahnemann recognized that if you have any regard for humankind, you're not going to subject people to violent experiments in the name of uh, medicine. Um, and then I think this is my last, yes, this is my last aphorism that I wanted to pull out just some of these themes. Um, in aphorism 144, he says, let all that is supposition merely asserted or even fabricated be entirely excluded from such a materia medica. Let everything be the pure language of nature carefully and sincerely interrogated. And I also love that because that is the experience of doing provings and the way that we interface with these substances in our world, right? It's about learning the language of nature right, about getting that feeling and that experience of immersing ourselves in another substance, another being on this earth, whether it's a plant or an animal, um, you know, or a mineral or anything like that, that this engaging that we do through provings is learning that language of nature and, and that our job is to interrogate that and to be truthful to it. Um, and just like we have fidelity in the way that we trace the case, we have fidelity in the way that we observe nature and the way that we observe those symptoms that come about through provings in all different corners of the world. <clears throat> it was a pretty, it was a pretty advanced thing that he was tapping into at that time, and I think it still is.
All right, before we shift into some kind of just technical things, any questions or comments about some of these aphorisms? Intentions behind the provings? It's so, thank you so much, Kelly, for bringing these into it. It's so much easier to read pieces of the organon when you are dealing with them in the context of some idea or goal or usefulness. You know, to sit down and read the organon end to end as if it were a chapter book is just kind of challenging. But when you can say, okay, I'm really interested right now in provings. And so I'm going to grab these pieces right here that really help me understand Hahnemann's thinking about it. It makes it so much easier. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so again, it was aphorisms 105 to 145. These are from Wendell O'Reilly's um, translation, which is good and easy, um, but any translation will do. And, um, and then of course, Jeremy's book discusses, you know, fleshes a quite a bit about, of these out. So it's a nice thing to have side by side. So some of the things that are brought up in um, Jeremy's book are, you know, kind of this question like, do we even need more provings, right? I think the Orem project, their last figure was like, we have 8,500 substances and, you know, something in the neighborhood of like 7,000 of them have provings associated with them. So do we really need to continue to do provings? And in aphorism 162, Hahnemann talks about the partial remedy, right? That we use the best remedy that we have to cover the symptoms that we have, but oftentimes that remedy will not cover the full case. And so then we move to the next remedy that covers the case as much as possible or what's left. And then we move to the next one. You know, we all know that dance. And so this is where the idea of should we do more provings kind of comes in. Jeremy says, hey, before I prove sc scorpion, maybe somebody would have been given platina or anacardium and it would have covered some of the case. But now that scorpion's been proven, and it shows where it overlaps with platina and anacardium, and yet it has its own place. People who need scorpion are gonna be so much better served than they would have been if they had only been given platina and anacardium. And you can say that about so many different remedies. You know, before we had lacumanum, oh my God, how many people are experiencing deep healing from getting lacumanum? or swan, or hydrogen, or chocolate. I mean, so many of these provings um, that we didn't even know that we needed before. But as soon as they come out and the picture comes out, oh my gosh, wow. I know people who need that remedy, right? I don't know if you have ever sat in a seminar before and heard about a new proving or even a remedy that you didn't know about before. And suddenly you can think of like five or six people who need that remedy and you didn't even know that remedy existed before you were treating them with other things. And so the challenge becomes, well, we kind of know platina and we kind of know anacardium. And now there's this new remedy, scorpion. This is where we want to learn how to read provings because if we're not sitting in seminars having somebody teach us the remedy, which is a beautiful thing, but you know, time and money. Um, we need to be able to access that information. We need to be able to identify and be like, oh, wait, it's Scorpion that this patient needs, not Platina. So there's definitely a case for more provings for sure, because there's an infinite amount of times that things can be shifted just to the left or just to the right to get something that fits in that space just perfectly. That's a beautiful thought, Kelly. Can I add one more idea here? Sure. Um, the, the challenges that we face in our particular area, I wonder sometimes if the provings that we're doing, like you mentioned chocolate, you know, and scorpion, and I, I wonder 
if when people are inspired to do approving, um, if that actually ends up being something where they say, I wonder if this is an important medicine for our time. You know, the people who did the, the provings of the imponderables of um, cell phone radiation and things like that. Do you suppose that a time calls forward provings? Of, I, I know this is completely conjecture, but maybe you've seen something about this or talked with Jeremy about this. Does a time call forward provings of something that that time needs? I think I've heard Jeremy say something about this, about Olive. Yeah, I mean, I would think so. I know that his process is he, you know, he kind of makes a prayer and asks for an omen. So, you know, he kind of leaves, it. You know, he doesn't make, always make a conscious decision about what he wants to prove sometimes, but not always. Right. Um, but I think it, it, you can almost see it in, along with the way that the periodic table and I don't mean the remedies of the periodic table, I mean the substance, the way that elements were um, discovered and how you can kind of see that mirrored in our history, right? So it's like as humanity and society marched through time, it was almost like the elements that influenced that came up at the same time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Like the radioactives and, you know, those deep, um, you know, deep earth remedies that were not things that people knew, you know, when they previous were to that. Nickel and iron. Yeah. yeah. And that was great for that time. So maybe there will be things that are coming out in provings that, that up to this point, nobody would even have thought to prove because they are the remedies of an emerging age. Well, I actually have a great experience. I have a great story about that, about approving that I did um, with the Northwestern Academy. It was technectium, which is element. I can't remember right now, but it's one of it's it's further down. But it's it's an element that is used in um, imagery machines like MRI and things like that. And this very fascinating thing happened. So I I took the remedy. And, you know, of course, you don't know what it is. And then the way that their protocol is, is you're on, you're either being observed, taking it live by your supervisor, or in my case, because I wasn't there for the physical taking of it in a group, um, I had my supervisor on the phone with me. And I just felt like I had to go out in the woods and take a walk. And so I went and I was just, you know, stream of consciousness, talking, talking, talking about what was coming up for me. And then after I got up the phone with her after about an hour, I'm, I'm in the woods and it was about this time of year and I had my phone and I could not stop taking pictures. I mean, I was just <laughs> all in the woods. I'm just taking pictures, taking pictures of trees. And I mean, <clears throat> and it was so strange because I was in a lot of ways having this very immersive nature experience, but I could not get away from my phone. And when we did the extraction, this idea of remote viewing was just through the entire proving. Wow. And I mean, that is such a piece of our time right now. Um, so yeah, so that was kind of fascinating. Yeah, so that's a perfect example about how maybe, um, you know, in, in a way that a society calls forward the tool that it needs for that time, that dilemma maybe the provings that are coming forward, which emphasizes why we can't, you know, sometimes people say, well, I'm just a Polycrest subscriber. I'm a good, reliable homeopath. I work with my 50 or 70 things, Hahnemann did them in the Materia Medica Pura. Most people get mostly better and, and it's all good. Why do I need to study new provings? And the example that you just gave is perfectly why. Yeah. Yeah, Marjorie says carcinogen and maybe lanthanides needed in more recent decades. Yeah. And yeah, I think the lanthanides are a great example of that. Um, I haven't used them a bunch, but I mean, I do, I do know about them and, and some of the indications are certainly in line with some of the issues that seem to be very particular to our time. Um, and Ruja, you said the participants that are proving are supposed to be healthy. But in today's society, everyone carries some mistunement. Do new provings express the current mistunement better? Um, well, I mean, I think, I think, you know, yes. In today's society, 
everyone's mistuned. I mean, I don't, I think we're mistuned differently than people have always been. Um, you know, you wouldn't be able to respond to any remedy, even way back when Hahnemann was doing provings, if there wasn't a susceptibility there to respond to. Um, the thing about provings today, I think is, well, one, and this is something that we're going to dive into quite a bit, is when people are writing their symptoms up and when we are looking at a proving, you're looking at people speaking the way that you speak, right? There's a language um, similarity that makes it very easy in some ways to access these provings better than you could older provings or some of like Materia Medica, Medica written, um, you know, a hundred years ago. Um, so some of, I think, the expression of what we can see in these provings simply has to do with that. It has to do with the language that we're talking to people from our own time. And so therefore they can communicate things that we understand because we're all in it together right now. Um, and it's something that we have to kind of do a mental shift when you're reading about provings from the Victorian era where it's, you know, everything's about religion or, um, you know, being hysterical, you know, it's different vocabulary and it's different. So there's this cultural translation that has to take place that doesn't have to happen for us when we're reading new provings. So that's the way that I think about that. I don't know if that's helpful. Um, so, Kent said you can count on 25 decent provings since Hahnemann. He says they leave out what they call imagination and put in morbid anatomy. I love Kent. I love how irreverent he is, which is funny because he was so, um, <laughs> sweet nice. lace. but I appreciate, I really appreciate his, he just says it like it is for himself. Um, so I kind of take this idea being that basically as the quality, the number of quality provings go up along in a graph, along with the results that our results will go that, you know, what we will see in our prescriptions will increase. This should be results. Well, this is the results. You understand <laughs> this, the more quality provings we have, uh, this should be number of cases and this line represents our results. Um, because when you have, when you don't have good quality provings to base your Materia Medica on, then you're not working with quality tools. It's just like when you see a, when you see a master craftsman's tool shed or their workshop, they have the highest quality things. It doesn't necessarily mean the most, most expensive. It's not necessarily going to be the fanciest or whatever, but tools that they know how to work with, they're standing the test of time and they can turn out a kind of work that somebody else can't do if they have a lesser quality tool shop. So I think it's kind of like that, you know, um, and one of the things that we'll definitely be doing is looking at different, you know, a range of different provings and kind of identifying like what is a high quality, good proving that you can stake your cases on versus what are some provings where it's like, okay, you know, there's a little bit of information there, but am I going to stake this case on this proving? Mm, maybe not. Every homeopath has to make that decision for themselves. Sometimes you have a situation with a case where you know what, this may not be the highest quality proving, but this is the information that's there and this is what you have to go with. So you're going to go with it. But I think having, understanding the difference between all these different resources and the quality behind them and why you're going to pick it or not pick it is makes all the difference to not knowing the difference and treating one just like it's the same um, quality or the same will give you the same results as another one. Huge difference. So let's just, okay. So before I go on to, I was kind of switching topics here a little bit. Um, 
a lot of this stuff we'll get into more, especially as we get into the provings, but any comments on these ideas? Okay. So somebody said in the beginning that they felt a little bit hesitant about doing provings, which I totally, totally understand. Um, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about why we do them, right? Why do we overcome maybe our hesitation and take that risk and do approving? Um, and Jeremy said, in approving, one gains direct knowledge of the inner nature of the remedy. To actually be approving rather than just to read Materia Medica is a totally different experience. Without provings, homeopathy becomes mainly an intellectual pursuit to be void of a real experiential base. And I think it's, you know, he's saying it very clearly. There's not too much to interpret here, but when you do engage with a substance in that way, it is different. It is very different than taking a remedy for yourself or having your, your homeopath prescribe a remedy for you. Because most homeopaths are in treatment, right? And we may think, well, why do I have to do approving if I'm already taking remedies my homeopath is giving me? right? I mean, that's experiential, right? That's experiencing homeopathy and treatment and engaging with it. And it totally is. And it's, that is absolutely valid. And I hope that everybody does do that. But the thing about the proving that's different is there's this element of surprise to it. It is stepping into the unknown in a way that we don't in so many other aspects of our life. And even when your homeopath gives you a remedy, there's a knowing, there's an intention, there's a circumscribing of what your problem is and a knowing that this remedy over here is going to help alleviate that in some way. But when you step into approving, it's truly this Zen moment of, I don't know. I don't know what this is going to provoke in me. I don't know what this substance is. You know, maybe you have a deathly fear of bats and it's bat. I mean, you just have no idea. And so there's this place you have to go to in yourself that is very different than where we are in the rest of our lives. And I think that is also something we ask our patients to do. And so part of this for me is about being willing to do what I'm asking my patients to do. And me taking a remedy for my homeopath is not the same because I understand that process. But our patients don't understand our process to the same extent that we do, right? Some of them come, they've never heard of homeopathy before. They're only here because somebody referred to them or they are desperate or, you know, there's so many different reasons why people end up in our offices. And most of the time, it's not because they think homeopathy is amazing and they want to do it. <laughs> um, so they take a big leap, so many people who come to us. And especially when there's an aggravation, and when there's things that come up that they didn't anticipate, I didn't know I was going to start reliving these dreams or these nightmares, or I didn't know these feelings that I thought I had put to rest so long ago were going to come up, or, oh my God, why is my body covered in spots? They don't know those things are going to potentially happen to them. And if we have actively put ourselves also in that state, which we can do through provings, then we can hold that space so much better for them. You know, we can, we, we can say, I understand in a way that's harder to say when we haven't made that leap. And it's expansive. Doing provings is expansive. And I think it's better than any drug in a lot of ways. <laughs> I'm not anti-drugs, done with some drugs in my own lifetime, but provings are so unique. And you can have this amazing transformative experience while you go about the rest of your life. <laughs> it's pretty hard to do that if you're if, uh, with narcotic drugs. And Hahnemann really identified this too. Um, he says that when you, when you're doing approving, it helps you to become a good observer. 
And that is something, of course, that is one of the paramount skills that we need. Um, and that every time you do one, you want to do more because you see more, you experience more. It expands your world. And there's something so intoxicating about expanding, about growing. Um, and, you know, and Jeremy acknowledges, like, sometimes people have great proving experiences and sometimes you have really crappy ones and you suffer. But most people, even if they've had a difficult time with their proving, would not say that they wouldn't, they wish they hadn't done it. I did a proving last winter. The last couple of years, I've done them with the Northwestern Academy of Homeopathy with uh, Jason Eric Henneke, the master prover there. And last winter at this time, we did sandalwood. And I mean, I didn't know what it was, but I... I really had a dark night of the soul with that remedy. Um, I was plagued with the most crippling doubt I have ever had in my entire life. I thought, why am I a homeopath? I don't know how to do this. I can't, why am I even teaching? This is stupid. Why, I can't believe people are paying me to teach. I like was ready to quit my podcast. I thought nobody's listening to this. Oh my, it was just, and for people, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not an egotistical person, but I don't engage in a lot of doubt in my, it, normally, you know, like I, um, I have doubt, but I just think, well, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> well, <laughs> and I in the proving, it just becomes your very real state. Oh, yes. When you're in the proving, you don't think, oh, well, this isn't me. This is a proving symptom. It's I very, very real. That. You're just there, right? Yep. You're just, it was... <laughs> I mean, I thought, and it, it spilled over from my work life into like my home life. My God, why did we move? I mean, it was just every decision I'd ever made, I suddenly felt like I had made the worst decision of my life. So it was just this crippling, crippling doubt. It was very difficult. But then, then the transition happened. And it was amazing. It was like, it was like that third stage of birth where you feel like you're gonna die. And, you, and that's when you're, you know, women are throwing things and crying and thinking, I can't do this, I'm gonna die. I just, I can't give birth to this baby, I'm gonna die. And then they come out the other side and it was like that. And um, it, was, it was an amazing, amazing experience. But that was definitely one of the most, psych, you know, emotionally and psychologically challenging ones I've had. Wow, has that, has that proving? been completed and published yet? <coughs> it was just put out in this last issue of uh, the American Homeopath. Oh, excellent. Yep. Um, oh, gosh, we only have five minutes. Okay. Um, okay, Kent. Kent's uh, philosophy about proving you'll find in lecture 28, which is also really, really great to read. Um, and the pieces I wanted to bring out about Kent were, you know, you can read it one way, which is that he's talking about kind of keeping, he talks about keeping man kind of simple and gentle and innocent. But the big thing that I get out of what Kent writes is that, is this idea of unknowing. That, that when you, when you realize how much there is to know, it keeps you humble. And it keeps you engaged. And you can stay with homeopathy because you realize how much there is to know. He says something in there about how many homeopaths, young homeopaths he sees who, you know, say they love homeopathy and they do homeopathy for a while and then they quit. And he says it's because they feel like they've done it all. There isn't anything else to know. They've been giving the same remedies. They're doing it, doing, doing it. And they want to move on to other things. But there's something about provings that shows us how much we don't know, right? Because I couldn't have in a million years have predicted that that was the experience I was gonna have when I took that remedy with sandalwood. Um, so it keeps us humble and it keeps us in that unknowing, which I personally feel is so important. Okay, a uh, little practical things. Um, so there's full Hanumanian provings, which are often you know, a group of people who take the uh, potentized substance, and they're followed with a supervisor over the course of 
30 days to the true ones are 40 days, but sometimes people go longer, sometimes only 30 days. Um, and then, you know, every, every symptom is recorded and they're collated and published and um, we'll look at, you know, examples of those. But then there are informal provings. And I love this little bit that Jeremy writes in the book. He says, many old homeopaths used to do this. They would wake up on a busy Tuesday and think there's not much happening today. Only 40 patients to see and a couple of articles to write. I may as well pop a remedy and experience a minor proving. <laughs> and then they would enter a small proving. And uh, you see things like Dr. Jones had difficulty attending his patients today as he couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> I tried to find some examples of that and I couldn't find any, but, um, Clark, but there's Maria Medica has a bunch of those little snippets through it. Which one? Clark's Dictionary of Practical Materia Medica. Oh, okay, cool. And they are silly sounding, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Hahnemann really, I mean, he really encouraged people to do provings on themselves, you know, just, just take a remedy and just see Absolutely. what happens. So there's informal provings, there's trituration provings, which are, you're going to create the substance in, you know, I've done this quite a bit. So you have your mortar and pestle, you have your substance and your milk sugar, and you all sit around a table and you're grinding, 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 you're scraping the bowl, you're grinding and scraping, you do it in like three minutes and uh, five minutes of grinding and three minutes of scraping or something. There's a whole protocol to it. And the essence of the remedy comes out or people start proving the remedy as they are triturating the substance. And it's a very, it's, it's a very wild experience because people sit down at the table and they're all fine. And then they start grinding and scraping. And next thing you know, you're just watching this whole group of people in a completely different state than they were 10 minutes ago. And then it just progresses from there over the course of the hours that you're doing the trituration. So Jan Scholten does a lot of those for his um, plants theory and stuff like that. I mean, he'll, he's done seminars where they will triturate five remedies in a day. Woo! Same group of people. Yeah. We did this in Haiti with graffitis with mm. gravel. And the students got things like burning on their skin and a sense of heat and cold. And one of them even got skin eruptions on her hands. Really? During the trituration? Right during the trituration, yeah. Wow. Wow. That's remarkable. Um, you can do a trituration combination, which I've also done, which is so you do the trituration and then every, you run it up to a 12C and then people take the 12C dose and then you continue on with a Hanumani improving after that. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. And then of course there's meditation and dream provings. So I don't, it, you know, sometimes that you sit in a seminar and um, the whole room will do a meditation proving the seminar leader will have the remedy. Uh, I did this with Misha Norland. We did, um, Oh, what's her name? She's some guru in um, India and he had some of her hair and we all did this. Um, Oroville. She was from Oroville, I think. If that's familiar to anyone. Anyway, and we all did this meditation proving on her hair. And then dream provings where you might put the remedy under your pillow and see what comes up in your dreams. And these are all things you should definitely look for when you're finding provings right? You want to know what kind of proving was done. And here are some places to find provings. Um, and I would definitely encourage people to go poke around and just start getting familiar with some of these sources. So, you know, Hahnemann's Materia Medica Pura, of course, are his provings. Allen's Encyclopedia is the other kind of couple volumes of most of the old classic provings. If you have software like McRepertory or Radar Opus, then depending on the package that you have, there are tons of provings typically included there. Um, more modern provings. Provings.info is a fantastic website. It's run by uh, Jörg Wiekman. I just recently interviewed him for the podcast. He's dedicated 10 years to basically creating the place to go online to find provings. So it's not only has um, references to all of the old provings, but any new provings. And if there's a free download, if you can access it online, then the link will be there or it will tell you what book or journal or wherever you can find it. 
it is um, something you have to, you might be able to get like a month free or something. And then I want to say it's 40 bucks a year or something, which seems really reasonable. Misha Norland School of Homeopathy has provings, Lou Klein's Luminos provings. These are all things you can Google. Um, Great Lakes provings is a small group that does those trituration, um, high anemone and hybrids. The Northwestern Academy, as I mentioned, um, groups of folks in Europe who do these C4 triturations. So instead of just bringing it up to a C3, they go to a C4 and there's a whole philosophy behind that you can check out. Of course, there's tons of provings in old journals. The New York School of Homeopathy has some. Um, you can find all of Jeremy's provings that are published at dynamis.edu. They're some of the highest quality, most beautiful provings available. And then there's a bunch of those short provings on Jan Schulten's Cure site. Sorry, you can't read that. It made it to a link. It's kj, sorry, qjure.com, Cure. Um, and that dovetails in with his plant system. And we're at 1202 here in Maine. So thank you so much, Kelly. You know, um, I've been doing this for 25 years and I've been involved with homeopathy for 30 years. And I am in awe and wonder with this every day. And I just want to thank you. I just love to hang with the other homeopathy geeks. Yeah. You know, and it's so fabulous to see your passion about this and, and to, to reflect back on Hahnemann and the vision that he had that's still ahead of the pack. 170 years later, it's still ahead. And we are so privileged to dabble our toes in this pool. Does anybody from, from the attendees have some last comments for Kelly? So our next session for Provings, for Fun with Provings, will be the last Friday in March. And uh, then, you know, put it on your calendar. It'll be this same time frame. You can RSVP for it on the events calendar, either to attend live or to watch it later. And of course, if you have any questions, you can put those out there on the forum for us. There'll be a forum topic for proving. So please okay. um, go out there and, and say hi and make a comment. All right. Thanks Great. to you all. You guys take good care and we will see you on the next mentoring session. Thanks everyone.